anyway, so um, you have time to get your bearings. Um, well, welcome everyone. Thanks for joining either in person or on Zoom. Um, I'm very excited about this conversation. I met Ken. Um, also, there's the camera right there, but I'm going to look up at the Zoom. And if that's un unnerving, I'm sorry. Um, I met Ken. Uh, he's a colleague and friend of my dad's. They study together. Um, and I was on the hunt for exciting people to bring to the Villainous Jewish Public Library to speak. And uh, Ken, very rightfully so, was one of the first people that crossed my mind. Um, and then upon meeting Ken uh, via Zoom, um, he made the connection between myself and Laura, who um, is a cultural historian who works at the Lithuanian National Library. And um, I've been very lucky to get to know her in the last couple of weeks and, and oh. her work and Laura, are you here? Okay. And, um, and her work as well as the work that went into uh, Ken's project, When I Grow Up, which I have a hard copy here. Um, so if anyone's sitting in the audience, feel free to poke me and grab it. Hi, Laura. Yeah, I think we can see you. Hi, hi. Yeah. Um, Sorry for the technical mess. Uh, I'll try to. Um, so Ken, I'll let you, I'll let you jump right in with your okay. presentation. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Hi. Hi, Laura. Nice to see you. Hi, nice to see you. Long time no see. Yes, well, it brings back memories. Um, and, uh, so many exciting things to talk about with this, uh, with this group and, and this project. And I'm really, really happy that, uh, that Laura is joining us, uh, let me just say that this could not have happened without Laura. Laura's uh, and and her husband and everybody. It was just I can't even thank thank everybody enough. Uh, and so I'm going to go through a little bit of a background. And I actually was just running around um, before we got started because I did a lot of research to do this. But let me tell you a little bit about me, and then I'm going to go through a little background presentation so you get a little bit of a sense of what I did. And of course, we'd love to take some questions. And Laura can um, can chime in at any time. You guys okay? I hear a little bit of an echo, but that's all right. So um, currently, I live in uh, Evanston, uh, Illinois, near Chicago. Um, I was originally a kid here, but I lived in New York forever, and I became um, a cartoonist for the New Yorker magazine, among other things. And uh, I moved through that into doing uh, graphic novels, but graphic novels that are historical, nonfiction, biography, and things like that. So I did a um, graphic novel history of the philosopher, who some of you may have heard of, uh, by the name of Hannah Arendt. Uh, she wrote The Origins of Totalitarianism and many other things, and uh, that's a whole other presentation for another time. Uh, but uh, when I finished that, I was looking for another topic. And uh, I, uh, you know, was looking at different subjects of individual people. Uh, I looked at Susan Sontag, I looked at uh, Sun Ra, I looked at all different kinds of things. And then by uh, sheer accident, one afternoon, uh, I went to a presentation, uh, somebody, you know, they had advertised it and it was lost, you know, discoveries of artifacts from Vilnius and it was a cold Sunday you know coffee will be served blah 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 so I went there and uh, this gentleman started presenting this slideshow and talking about the discoveries of these documents now this was in February of 2018 um, and I had no idea I was completely blown away when he started to go through some of the things that were found uh, that, that had been hidden in Vilnius. And when he got to the part about the autobiographies of these um, teenagers, uh, I, I was just stunned. So I went up to the podium after the thing, I pushed all these other people out of the way. And I said, um, is anybody doing anything with these? And, uh, and also, as a, you know, there's a Yiddish term, uh, which means kind of like it was meant to be. And there's a Another term, I think it comes from uh, Arabic, uh, 
kismet. And so this was a combination of those two things. The guy looked familiar. Uh, he was very nice. He said, you got to go to Vilnius. I didn't even know where Vilnius was. But before I knew it, I was on my way to Vilnius. I believe it was the summer of 2018. I had gotten in touch. Oh, he said there's going to be a conference of um, Jewish librarians in Boston next weekend. So I went and that's where I met Lara. Lara was there. And one thing led to another. And then I eventually found out that this um, gentleman who was speaking was actually uh, his parents and my parents were, were great friends, Jonathan Brent. And uh, everything kind of, you know, there were a lot of, when you're making a book, there's a lot of question marks. I, first of all, I had to figure out where Vilnius was and get there. Um, but I did. And Lara and her team were sort of going through these documents, which I'm going to um, now share my screen and give you a little bit of a sense of, um, of the book. Hopefully it won't take too long. Oh, here we are. Okay, so Beba, Beba, you'll find out who Beba is. Um, Beba's Vilna and my Vilnius. So this is a photograph of my hand looking at one of the autobiographies uh, written in Yiddish script. In the late summer of 2018, I held a miracle in my hands, a student notebook. Its paper was unblemished and the writing, though indecipherable to me, was inked as crisply as if it had been written this afternoon, except that it hadn't. The words had been jotted down more than 80 years earlier. The only evidence of the notebook's age and its journey of being hidden twice, lost once, and finally unearthed just a year before I came across it were three rusty shards that had once been staples, barely anchoring the 20 or so tightly scrawled pages. Blood red splinters ever so slightly staining irregular halos. Question, I said to the archivist who was uh, Migla uh, at the Martinez Matsvidis National Library of Lithuania. How many people have flipped through this notebook since 1939? Two, she said, you and me. Catching my breath, I turned another page. And here you can see uh, a page from another one of the notebooks. I just took photographs of these. And there are the staples uh, and the blood red and the halos and all that. And uh, you can see it's 1939 and this is a volume. And uh, those of you, yeah, you're all studying Yiddish. So, you know, it kind of, it reads like uh, Hebrew. And uh, these were astonishing. So that is the book that resulted and um, as a side note, it, it just came out in French, was translated, and I was lucky enough to be in Paris for the launch a month or so ago. It, um, in French, they are calling it Vivre, uh, to live, and uh, kind of amazing. It's there, the, the French are really taking to it. Uh, well, that's not amazing, it's just nice. So the contest, so what, what was this thing that I, how did these documents come to be? Uh, to figure out the future of what I've dubbed Yiddishuania or Yiddishuanian civilization, uh, the scholars at YIVO, which I'm sure you guys are familiar with, I call Yiddishuania's university without walls for its nation without borders, uh, decided to ask the youth. They, they didn't even have the term teenagers yet, what we would now call teens. Uh, YIVO came up with the audacious idea of letting the young people lead. So they cloaked an ethnographic study in the guise of a writing competition. They would offer a uh, 150 Zloty prize and it would be uh, given anonymously. Uh, they had a code, coded system to find out who sent it in. Uh, over the course of the 1930s, over 700 of these rolled into Vilna, which was where the capital of Yivo, uh, the center of Yivo was in three different waves. And the date of the final award, uh, it was September 1st, 1939. Uh, needless to say, a very bad day and everything was lost and no prizes were awarded. That was the day that the, uh, the war, World War II started. So um, I was in Vilnius that summer for about three and a half weeks. As, as Laura knows, I was getting to the library a lot and it was hot, it was in the middle of the summer. But I was very lucky. Um, Laura's husband showed me around um, and I had a chance to really 
explore the town and I'll show you I I uh so these were this is what I confronted when I got there it probably brings back memories for Laura um they had these were some of the documents that had been found and when I got there uh Migla and Laura had kind of given a little pressy a little quick overview of what some of them were about and we tried to figure out who they were so this one they were they were not to put their name or any identification of the town or people or anything in it and they they made a lot of rules it was supposed to be a certain amount of t uh, pages it was supposed to be people of a certain age and uh suffice it to say a lot of the rules were broken but uh you can see this one was Warsaw, 1937. They came in from all over uh, the Yiddish-speaking world. So this one we call Bizizma, the introspective. Uh, I don't think we ended up using that one. We didn't use Schneider, the tailor. And it's interesting, Schneider means tailor. So, you know, he called himself what he did. Here are some more with some nice notes. And, you know, I was struck as I was looking at these because I'm an artist and a writer by the visual appeal of these books they were just incredible uh just beautiful and you can see the handwriting varied from very very sharp to messy there's some more of those staples and i really felt like i was confronting that i was standing next to the people who wrote these it was really quite remarkable um, the one on the right there, which is Bat Zion, I didn't end up using that one either. I mean, I had more um, translated by, uh, fully translated by um, uh, Ellen Cassidy, who's a great translator over here. But um, for various reasons we can talk about. The other thing that's quite interesting, you can see on the cover of the one on the right, there's the stamp and you'll see that. I mean, Yevo really... Um, uh documented these things very very beautifully uh it was amazing so when i was there you know vilnius as you all know is is just you know incredible you know modern city very very beautiful and also it has a uh, vilna which was the you know the jerusalem of uh lithuania very storied uh city within it so i had a search for vilna in vilnius and to do that, I kind of triangulated, if you will, two different maps. The one on the right there, uh, this is Vilna 38 and 39, uh, was from a book by Lucy Davidovich, which I have here called From That Place in Time, which is quite a remarkable document. I mean, she, she went on to become a, a Jewish historian of note and cultural critic, and I got a lot of her, her stuff. But when she was a teen, she she was a uh, like a um, a fellow uh, and came to Vilnius from New York City, and she was able to get out uh, before the war because she was an American. So I used her map, and then there was a modern tourist map on the left, and you can see I tried to figure out where everything was based, you know, on the time, and uh, it still holds up pretty well. I mean, as those of you who've gone through the area that's the ghetto no um you know it's pretty well there's a lot of things that are preserved there uh this is the area going down to um where the great synagogue was and uh, i toured around there with uh laura's husband and it was kind of amazing and i took pictures and tried to figure out where everything was and i kept getting drawn back to that area and I believe this is uh, actually Ilya's, uh, show, showing us a photograph of a street. That's my wife's hand. And uh, you can see the he's pointing out like that church in the back. So we know that that was the same street. And, you know, I took a lot of pictures. Here's a, a building some of you may have seen. I hope it's, it's still there uh, in the ghetto, the area of the ghetto where it has writing still from, you know, Yiddish and I believe Polish. Kind of amazing i went in that building and poked around uh when i when i'm doing research i tend to do that and then if people tell me to go i go um this was looking down the same street you can see i i did a painting of that street which i included in the book and some guy was walking there 
And on the left is where the Gaon Synagogue was, and that green fence is where the, uh, I don't know if it's still there, but um, sort of Russian, it was a, it was a, a Soviet kindergarten. And uh, this was incredible, you know, then looking up the street and, uh, you know, I'm trying to figure out what was there. And uh, that tall building you see at the end of the street was the Great Synagogue. And I think in front of it was the Strashen Library, if I'm not mistaken. And then in the Great Synagogue, you walk down a few steps and, and it just, it, I mean, I couldn't even contemplate uh, the grandeur of what that place must have been. Um, and, you know, I looked at paintings that were done by people like Raphael Hlos, and uh, I know Chagall had checked it out. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to sort of inhabit the environment uh, of because I, I believe, you know, in what I'm doing, since I'm putting pictures and words together, I can get a sense. And, you know, uh, and Vilnius is quite a remarkable city, as you know. I mean, it's in a kind of in a valley. And, uh, yeah, it was really wonderful. That was the, I found myself going back. I made a painting. I, I thought I might use it. That was the um, kindergarten, which had been shut down. Then I had to so Beba was a character, one of the characters in the in the in the book. So you know, uh, the New York Times ran an article on it, and they published this picture. And uh, this was from early 1933, one of the earlier uh, research parts of it. And uh, there's an incredible story about this, but this picture was there. So uh, I was looking around, and I ended up calling her the rule breaker. And I'm going to give you a little bit of an example of what I tried to do with the um, six autobiographies that I used in the book. So just to give you a sense of how the graphic uh, narrative works. So uh, there's her thing. I was born in Vilna on the 19th of July. And you can see her riding her bike and sort of, you know, I there was archival, there was pictures of old Vilna that I used and She was riding her bike around. She's thinking about 150 slotti. And her brother says, how come you rode dad's bike to the stationery store? And she goes, I had to get stuff for this big autobiography contest. I'm going to win 150 slotties. What are you going to write about? The truth. And they mentioned she mentioned they had a cat, so there's their cat. It's actually my cat. Uh, why don't you write about the time you ignored mom and went out in the snow in your new summer dress and got so sick you almost died? That's true. She that she she does end up writing about that in her book and she noted that she's left-handed too, which I... Uh, are you crazy? That makes me look really stupid. And anyways, it's way too sad. And then this was a street in, in Vilnius that I found from a photograph. Um, but you were sick for so long, you were seeing things that might win it for you. Modi, go out and play with your toys. I can't write a thing with you hanging over my shoulder. And then it said the competition was limited, and I have her thinking what they don't know won't hurt them. And now we get into her reminiscences of her life. One thing's for sure, I was a very naughty child. I would break everything in sight. When I was two, I crawled up on the buffet and pulled open the display case, and all the plates fell out and broke. I was sure I'd be yelled at, but instead everyone started to laugh so hard that I began to laugh too. But after my Zeta or her grandpa said, Beba, I have something very important to tell you. You must always be very religious. If not, God will spank you with iron rods. And there I drew a picture of God <laughs> or it wasn't really, it was from Michelangelo, but there he has iron rods and she's hiding under the chair. From then on, whenever I did anything wrong, I'd hide so God would not see me. There you see her hiding around the house. And she, at another point, you know, I, I've abbreviated this a bit. I'll never forget my first movie. And I found a, an old poster of Uncle Tom's Cabin and an old cinema. And it was Uncle Tom's Cabin, she says. The way the black people suffered, it was so horrible. At school, we had to read the book. I found out that the book was early translation into Yiddish and a big translation, big thing. 
and learned how on the boat from Africa it was worse than hell. Our teacher then told us about the tragedy of the Scottsboro Boys and how they're making a Yiddish play about it in Warsaw. Um, and there were a lot of interesting connections that I noted between the, um, the African-American community and African-American scholars in America. Uh, and Yivo, Max Weinreich, had gone over to study. And I thought it was so interesting that there was a lot of cinema there. So um, I just pulled uh, ads, because I'm trying to get a sense of what the world was like here, uh, from the Yiddish press. We've got Al Jolson, uh, Buster Keaton, you know, uh, Douglas Fairbanks, Josephine Baker, and 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 Beba says, since my first movie, I go to movies all the time, all by myself, and the theater too. And she's walking around. Hmm, maybe my brother Modi isn't such an idiot after all. I know what I'll write. And she's sneezing with her summer dress on in the winter. What the heck are all those boars staring at? As a result of that little walk, I was sick for five weeks. Um, that building is still there, just outside the ghetto, I believe, next to the Coral Synagogue. That was the Jewish hospital. The doctors at the Jewish hospital said a case like mine happens only once like every seven years. And she was sick. And then when I got out, I had to spend my summer at the health colony in Nova Vilenska. I liked it there, and with all the swimming and hiking and sunbathing, I finally got better. And then I imagine her riding her bike right away. Look at her. She's better for five minutes, and she's out again like a shot. Does she think she's immortal? Leave her be. The fresh air is good for her. This is a shot I, saw, I found of a, a Jewish camp there. So it looks like I'm going to go to he health camp again this summer. And there she is with her cat. But also something amazing about Beba the rule breaker. Uh, she made it. So here she is as a, uh, she passed away just a couple of years before the book came out, but her son, that picture that ran in the New York Times was noticed by a very good friend of hers. Uh, there was a, um, there was a Litvak, uh, rev, I don't know, d people from the DP camps that set up in all, of all places, Santa Monica, California. And Beba was a survivor. And there she is with her grandchildren. So um, that's just a little bit of a sample of one of the stories. Um, and, you know, I just want to um, show you just a couple of things here before I take questions. Um, so these are some of the books and things that I referred to. Um, here's the Davidovich book from that place and time. Uh, which was heavily thumbed and heavily, I mean, incredible memories of, of that era. Um, before I, some of the, di some of the diaries uh, had gotten out. Some of the autobiographies had gotten out. Long story, the Nazis came and raided Yevo, took a lot of stuff to Frankfurt. Um, there was a group of people called the Paper Brigade that Dave Fishman has written about and they saved a lot of these documents, but some of the ones that made it out to Frankfurt got back to New York. And um, this book is was one of the first ones that I got a long, long time before I even uh, did the thing called Awakening Lives. Jeffrey Chandler translated them verbatim. They were very, very long. I think I got this from my daughter when she was going into high school. She ignored it and I kept it. <laughs> it ended up being my story. Um, you know, and so many interesting, um, here's a book I came across, I don't know, the Jerusalem of Lithuania. I mean, I read everything I could, The Rise and Fall of Jewish Vilnius. Um, great book by Cecil Esther Kutz, Kuznets, Givo and the Meaning of Modern Jewish Culture. Um, I even found this book, uh, which was a contemporary book um, I don't know when it was from the 30s. It's called Youth <laughs> from Years 10 to 16. Because I wanted to find out why they would talk. I mean, it was very interesting to me in so many ways that, you know, they're trying to figure out the future of uh, what I called Yiddishuania, 
And the French pushed back on me a little bit because there was this wonderful book that came out in France several years ago called Yiddish Land, and in uh, with great photographs. And I refer I referred to it a lot. Um, and I just had a knee jerk. I didn't like the term Yiddish Land. I, I it, it's it reminded me too much of Disneyland. I mean, it works, but you know, I wanted to find something else, and so that's why I coined Yiddishuania. But um, and, you know, Davidovich wrote more and was very into that Yiddish culture. So that's just a very, very brief overview of, of the project. I mean, I would have to say, oh, another interesting little sidelight is after I got back, uh, my mom said, oh, my grandmother, my Bubby was from Vilna, was from Vilna. Uh, I, oh, why didn't you tell me that before I went there? Uh, and she insists that her name was um, spelled, it was, a, it was a Pell, but she says it's Apple, and we're still fighting about it and working on it. But in any case, um, there's a lot to tell. It's a magnificent city, a magnificent archive. It's so great to see Laura, who's doing just done such an amazing job, and, and all you guys. So I'll shut up and take questions, or uh, I'll hand it back to the, the MC there. there. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, I have I, I have a number of questions uh, for you, Ken, and I'm sure others as well. Um, but I would love to, before we transition um, into full, full questions about the book, also, um, I want to ask Laura, if, if you can, um, to recount a bit that moment in Vilnius and in like the world of archival and historical research. Um, the the be it the series of weeks, months, years when these um, diaries were found, and to sort of recount that time and what it was like on the ground, um, and what that discovery meant in the moment. It's an open ended question, free to interpret however you want. Okay, thank you, Mina. Thank you, Ken, for a fascinating. A uh, story which I, I recall it well, but it was so good to hear it from you. Uh, and uh, from our part of the story, uh, I would like to return to the point where we met uh, Ken with you. It was not just a conference in Boston, it was a conference uh, that uh, for the first, where for the first time I made a present. Uh, just a lecture on our findings, because before that we we we've already began to work and to sort and to to catalog and everything, but still it was mostly unknown uh, for for academic community, and this was the first time. And I was so amazed uh, by your reaction that you were just so fascinated by this rather obscure topic because it was a panel of archival work and I wouldn't expect anyone, uh, any artist to react as you did. And uh, it was, of course, very, very uh, important for us that you came and you make your research. And uh, here I must underline the, the, the role of Migla Anoshovskaya. She's a famous comic uh, novel artist of Lithuania. So when Ken uh, was about to, to come, I thought, who would guide him from our center, from our staff? Now Miglia doesn't work at the center, but uh, at, at the time she did. And she didn't beforehand work specifically with the autobiographies. But when I, like a scientist, who asked her to help Ken through his process, because they're both artists and also Miglia was an Yiddishist and could uh, help with the texts, and she agreed, you know, I don't know, Ken, if are you, are you aware even that it resulted in new development for Mikla as well. And as a result, we published the whole Beba autobiography translated into Lithuanian and into Yiddish with Mikla preface. And Mikla uh, wrote a really, really academic uh, article on the uh, problems of Jewish youth. And not only uh, on this autobiography, it's a broader context. So wow. of, from your visit, not one, but two books came out. More will come. Go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, and we are preparing now the, the third in the series, but it's it's uh, beside the point. What I wanted to add uh, also that if you come today, you would see how much work has been done and how beautifully the, the autobiographies, uh, particularly particularly uh, autobiographies, were already uh, catalogued and. Uh, described and presented and still we have a lot a lot of work left because the sheer amount of the documents is such that if you uh, just imagine that there are just remnants of what was here and there's such a huge amount and not only in the national library but also in other archives in Lithuania you can only just imagine how was it when every book and every document was at uh, its uh, respectable institution or, or in the rank, in the hands of its owner? Everything was in place. How huge and vast was this land? And at that point, and it would be my finishing point, I would disagree with you uh, in dubbing this uh, um, place anew. Like Yiddish, I, I agree, Ken. I don't like Yiddish land, the term Yiddish land as well. But I also think that before you dubbed it uh, Yiddish Rania, there was already a name of this land. And the name is Lite, which is Lithuanian Yiddish, which is just an uh, unforgettable word for everyone who was from here or, like me, came here at some point and just. Uh, immersed in 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 the whole continuum of the Jewish culture here. Thank you, Ken, so much. And thank you, Mina, to, to invite me. I, I'm very privileged to be a part of this uh, meeting. Wow, thank you. I'm just going to jump in and say Lita is uh, very, that's great. I wish I, I wish I had considered that at the time. And I'm going to kind of work that into my, because um, those of you know that there's a couple of there's the there's the uh, what is it they call it the uh, the the herring line or something you know between Lit Litvish and Litvaka and Gal and Galician uh, Yiddish so uh, yeah Lita I like that but I also think Yiddishuania has an obvious function in the book which is accessible to to English speaking Jews and non Jews for that matter I agree I I fully agree with that for the book it's perfect. Yeah, um, I mean they got. They, sorry, I'll just went. They they uh, did, I believe, if I'm mistake not mistaken, they actually got some a couple of submissions from from as far away as uh, Buenos Aires, you know, which was a big Yiddish um, yeah. community. So, but anyhow, go ahead, Mina. Yeah, thanks, Laura. Well, I I suppose I'll start with a question, Ken, um, which is kind of in response also to Laura's point on just the mass of of documents that there truly are. In, the years it's going to be um, before they are fully processed and explored, um, which is how did you decide which would make it into when I grow up? And I mean, I suppose, is there a feeling of like favoritism or what What had to stand out in, in the documents for you to choose, for, for it to make it to the final cut? Yeah, well, couple of several things and some are um some are i would call artistic or aesthetic decisions and some are practical mm -hmm. and uh L Laura can attest to this um some of these documents were in fragments and some of them were in bits and pieces um so if it was in fragments or in bits and pieces couldn't really didn't want to use it wanted things that were complete um secondly uh yiddish uh handwriting yeah. from teens from the 1930s is a very special uh, uh, thing to translate. Um, so uh, to a certain extent, they had to be legible. Um, so those are a couple. Uh, I'm going from sort of the maybe more pedestrian higher up. Um, another thing, uh, they had to all be from the new the new discoveries they had to be all from the ones that were in 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 Vilnius there had been some other ones but I couldn't I didn't want to touch those um I had done some reading about uh I'll call it Yiddishuania um and you know I wanted 
I was very impressed. One of the things that I, I, I set out to do, and I spoke to Jonathan Brent and other people at YIVO, was to show the diversity and the vitality of this, what they refer to as a civilization. Mm -hmm. um, I was struck by the fact that it relay it resembled a lot the bear, the Highland Park, uh, Illinois, uh, Deerfield, Illinois area that I grew up in. Um, we had, in my time, we had, you know, super sensitive, artsy Jewish girls who played guitar and sang sad songs. And we had super full of it, you know, right wing political kids. And we had partiers and we had everything. And we had self-loving Jews and self-hating Jews. And, 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 and believe it or not, there was the same thing in these kids. So I wanted to show the diversity. I wanted to show boys and girls or men and women. I wanted to show urban, rural, uh, observant, non-observant, and they were there. Uh, and so I had to parse that. I had to parse that out. And, um, you know, they had to be interesting to me and they had to have um, some visual appeal. You know, um, they had to have some scenes in there that I could draw, you know. Um, so for instance, in the first story, um, which I call the eighth daughter, um, she um, she has to run upstairs, you know, and uh, um, or or the the the, the beetle of the shul, the, the the shamus of the shul runs up and yells at her because she wants to stand and pray for her father, and he yells at her and says, "You can't do that! Don't you know women's prayers aren't worth worth anything?" The, the exact words that she wrote in the in the in the autobiography. Well, that's a scene. I can show a funny looking man with like talus on running upstairs to the um, to the balcony. So I was looking, you know, for things like that. So those were some of the, you know, I probably had twelve fully translated by Ellen, and I actually kind of drew up a couple that I didn't use. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. And then as well, like, how did you pro process ordering them and like a beginning to end picture of these six very different? Well, you know, making a book is a, is a really tricky thing, you know, um, for a long time, you know, spoiler alert. I mean, you guys got the Beba story, which is really kind of like, oh my God, I can't believe that, you know, oh, she survived and there are kids and stuff. And unfortunately, you know, I tried looking up the others and, you know, A, they were anonymous and B, if there were any names in them, um, there was a lot of people that had the same name. So it was, it was hard, hard to find it. But for a long time, I thought Beba was going to be the last one. I thought, oh, we'll build up to Beba, you know, and everyone will be, but, um, you know, uh, that wasn't working. It seemed, so I put her story in the middle and then I would re reveal at the end in the postscript. So I just felt that the eighth daughter, um, was, was such a striking way to start it off, you know, and you just kind of feel it, you know. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I feel like uh, as the visuals sort of started to gel, um, the one that I put at the end and I call her the skater, the ice skater, was a very um, wistful and very kind of beautiful story. And I thought that would be a nice way, especially the way she kind of ends it in, in, with, a, with a note of hope. It just felt very uh, like a good way to end it. Yeah, the skater, that's, I, to whatever extent I can, I agree with that choice of, of the skater. Um, in terms of the pro process of adapting between mediums, like starting from these, from these submissions, turning it into a graphic novel, the same way you would for turning it into a film, or, I mean, it would make a good mini series, I guess, although, Probably not a good idea. Um, no, very good idea. From your lips to God's ears, as they used to say. Okay. Um, what, I mean, these are real people. How did you turn them into characters that people would also want to read in a book? I mean, it's not, I don't want to say it's as simple as, like, it's not a simple artistic process, I guess. What, what, what boundaries do you have when you make something like this in terms of, uh, in that artistic regard of, of turning them into readable characters? Well, I mean, I think one of the things, and Laura will attest to this, I mean, um, I really want to not put anything fake in, in their world as much as I can. Like the more specific stuff can be in the pictures 
And luckily, you know, with the internet and also there in, at the library, they had some fabulous books um, that had, you know, loads of, of amazing photographs. And um, so I could get a sense of what uh, there was a there was a there was a type of radio that was manufactured, I think, in um, Kovno, a town is called Electrokit, and they had a big factory there. So I had to go like find out what the Electrokit radios looked like, and what did the phones look like, and what did the cinemas look like, and then I could march and walk around on the streets. And the more I could anchor myself in the reality of that world, uh, the better it was. Um, and then I had to kind of figure out and this was more difficult these weren't professional writers but they were really they followed the rules very well uh, the yevo people said we don't want um i mean it was quite funny in their in their rules they said no prizes will be awarded for flowery writing you know um just tell the truth and uh, they really did and i had to like by reading and rereading and rereading you know try and figure out what's the character like there was one i called the boy who the boy who liked a girl and it was really really tough to kind of nut that one out because his writing got very confusing in the middle um and i had to reread it and reread it and reread it and finally i figured out what it was um he and all his buddies liked the same girl and uh they wanted to get him off of her so um they kept saying oh go for this girl go for that girl go for this girl and that's why he says you know i stuffed my you think i'd stuffed my ears up with cotton but it was love you know he was lovesick and uh, and i kind of remembered what it was like to be a teenager and be lovesick for somebody and how that was the most important thing in the world so um i got a sense of his character but then i had to layer on it some of the incredible truths and there was another book i i couldn't put my finger on and I learned about the whole um, the Lithuanian uh, yeshiva uh, movement because he ended up going to a Musar yeshiva or kind of almost being hijacked, uh, you know, happily sort of reminded me of Pinocchio when the kids go to that island uh, to go there. And it didn't work out. But I had to learn about all the various different types of yeshiv yeshivas. And so the more I could anchor it in reality, then I could understand the the character of each of each kid and i hope they're distinct yeah the boy who liked a girl or who loved a girl um that has that was, had some of my favorite art in it for sure um also in comparison you spoke a bit you spoke at the beginning about your uh the three escapes of Hannah Arendt and uh, trans I'm curious also about transitioning from writing about a celebrity who's very known to those who are essentially anonymous to the world and how your um, process of being a biographer in that sense, how you adapted it to when I grow up or what things maybe surprisingly remain the same between the two processes. That's a really good question and a difficult one uh, to answer. I, I do know that after I finished Hana, as I refer to her, um, it was a sort of a very intellectual exercise, although she was quite a heroic person. I was trying to get at, you know, the humanity of her life. And I felt like I wanted to, to do something very emotional. And uh, I wanted to, um, it's interesting, I've thought about it, the the real hero, if you will, the real hero of of, of when I grow up or the protagonist, if you will, is the reader. Um, you, I mean, I, for me, I kept asking myself, you know, what would I have done? What, what, what would I? What could I do? You know, I, I, like that things like this might be happening in the world now. You know, what? How would I act? And um, I felt like with the when I grow up with those autobiographies, which which Laura knows very well. I mean, they're just staggering. They're just little, they're just like little tiny little notebooks. I mean, they're physically, they're really kind of just insignificant little things. But when you look at each one of them, they have a majesty because they're really, they're like, um, I said to the people at Yevo when I was working on it, I mean, Max Weinreich was, 
And all the people who worked at Evo were really good scholars. They were really were like, oh, we're going to do an ethnographic study and we're going to study and do all these reports and all this stuff. I completely misused <laughs> their research. I didn't do anything for studying. I just did it as like a thumbprint, a vision of a time. You know, um, I thought of it like uh, I was doing a painting of a, of a magnificent landscape. You know, I was just responding to these people. So that's that was the difference. I mean, Hannah Arendt, I kind of really had to try and figure out what her thinking. And this was more just to try and figure out their living. Yes. Well, that I mean, we spoke about this um, when we first talked. Um, yeah, about just the how surreal it is to be in a place with such a history pre pre war Jewish history and always walking that tightrope of experiencing it for its modernity and interesting alive aspects, but also remembering everything too in time. So that that idea of responding to them feels feels um that resonates. Um if there are I mean I could go, I could keep going. Um if there are other questions from either anyone in the building or uh, people can throw things out into the chat as well. Um, yeah, um, I guess also I was wondering when I was reading it, just if people want to think for a bit, which I appreciate. Um, I was wondering if you like dreamt about them while you were working on this or like how you feel like they lived with you. Well, you know, I can't really remember that much about when I was working on it because I was so obsessed with it, but they're all my... I feel like they're all my children now. That's for sure. I mean, uh, um, you know, and and to a certain extent, they're all me. Um, because when you're writing, you know, ha, ha, I mean, I I kind of knew what it was to play guitar, and I know a little bit about you know. You have to lean into what you know, but also the differences. And and I think I also had a sense. You know, I was in New York. I've said this in other talks, but I was in New York on 9 10, um, 2001, and I was in New York on 9 11, 2001. 9 10, in fact, 9 11, you know, I took my kid to school. Everything was fine for a while. Then all of a sudden went crazy and it was a beautiful day. These, these kids were, were living in that moment before. And, um, I had to erect a, a boundary and a barrier in my mind where I had to say, I kind of know what happened, but they didn't, you know, because you can't tell, you know, but also I didn't want to um, sugarcoat the fact that some of these people, they could see the, I called it the storm clouds were gathering a little bit. Like it wasn't a picnic. It was a tough time. It was a tough time. Yeah, I think that that, I mean, um, we have a question too, but um, I'll ask this, or I'll just say this, in my opinion, I feel like there was this, I kept on anticipating to turn a page and for it to be like, and then, like, but then you don't really do that, you let it sit, it, you let you let the present that they were in writing it really live, and it's not overtaken by what happened afterward, and that's a yeah, I mean, I'm sure your audience is familiar with the new book that came out or a fairly recent book by Dara Horn called uh, People Love Dead Jews. Right. I mean, I was trying to show the life and um, Vilna, Vilnius there, you know, and, and my world opened up to me. I mean, Avram Sutskever is now, I think, the greatest hero since uh, Pericles. I mean, I, I'm, I'm absolutely if I had maybe, you know, someday, maybe. I mean, he was a poet. He was a, he was a hero. He was a, I mean, I, his writing is incredible. I did not know about this guy before this, you know, I'm so, I mean, this, the wonders of this civilization just keep giving to me, you know, just keep giving. So. Yeah. Uh, we have a question uh, for either Laura or Ken um, or both, which is whether the diaries um, have been read by any current high school students. Um, I guess that's asking whether or not, yeah, they're in like circulation for educational um, purposes, if that's something you guys know about. Do you know, Laura? 
Uh, you're muted, Laura, you're muted. Sorry, uh, I know the story from our part. The uh, Beba book is very much in demand. Of course, we would be happy to have uh, Ken's book translated into Lithuanian. Uh, why, uh, before that happens, it is only available in our uh, uh, reading room. There are people who come for, for the book, but may, uh, let's be realistic. The things that are translated in, into Lithuanian are most uh, popular here. And uh, the uh, we also have several, my, my colleague at the center uh, had several educational sessions uh, around the book of Beba uh, and uh, the, the published book. And uh, yes, her story is very appealing. As to other autobiographies, of which, by, uh, by the way, uh, it's not only our place of uh, keeping them. There are quite a lot at the Central State Archives as well. I know about scholars, Lithuanian and uh, from abroad, who worked with the massive, massive of materials. But uh, like before it is introduced in, in Lithuanian language, it would, would never be a, a thing of mass interest. So now, for now, it's only Beba. Hmm. I know that they have, um, uh, they have a, like I've seen the English copies around town here in Vilnius, um, and I always wave to them, but you have. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that um, the Rothschild Foundation, uh, because they got in touch with me, um, they have a thing called Kaleidoscope, I believe, and they're trying to kind of re-envision something like this, uh, where they're asking people to write in and tell the talk about, they're trying to recreate an archive like this across Europe. So you might want to um, look into that. Uh, it's called Kaleidoscope. Um, and, uh, you know, I was, you know, I don't know what the level of it in, in, in American uh, high school uptake, blah, 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 is. But um, I'm going to talk to my agent about getting that Lithuanian. There's a wonderful publishing company there, um, Laura. I don't they did that. Fab, if you guys aren't familiar with it, they, I was looking for it. It's a book that like um, shows every house in the old uh, ghetto and, and it shows like who lived in there and stuff. It's just beautiful. I mean, they I don't have to tell you there are some fabulous publishers there. So, you know, uh, we'll see. But um, yeah, uh, I know the, the book that you're referring to is not only a book, it's a series of for now it's three books about three streets in the old town. And it's a Ooh. very, very uh, accurate and thorough resource. Indeed, it is. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, very, very interesting publishers, uh, publishers here. And if you are serious, let's get in touch uh, practically about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I, um, I would advise all the people there who are you know, your, other stu your other students in the library and the other people here who are on the call, you know, just just wander around. You know, that's all I I just wandered the streets and just look in the corners and and you'll feel it. You'll you'll feel you'll feel what was going on there. And I wanted to ask Laura one quick question before we go. I wonder, Laura, in, do you think that more stuff like this may be discovered, like hidden in 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 Lithuania or in the part of the, that part of the Ken, world? Can you don't you have no idea? We make make discoveries literally every day uh, yeah. we found since you were there we haven't uh, found like a mass cache of documents no but we found things here and there we also made discoveries within the discovery it's not like a pile of documents now for us we segregated them and and studied them and so every one of them is a discovery just recently mina uh worked uh, as a volunteer at our department, and uh, uh, she worked with the a nice suggestion uh, with the programs, uh, theatrical, film, and musical programs. And I asked her if it's only uh, that she is helping us, or does she found 
uh, find something for herself. And uh, I hope uh, that it was so because Mina confirmed that it is also interesting for her as well. So every every bunch of documents that we research is a discovery. Fantastic. I think that's a I think that's a beautiful note to end on. Um, oh, Giannis has a question. Do you? I do. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. go for it. Uh, I have a question. I mean, I'm a student of history, so I'm very interested in ar archival material, and I just wanted to kind of. I mean, Nina touched on this earlier, but I wanted to kind of bring it back. Uh, when speaking about these diaries specifically, um. I'm kind of just wondering what's the physically, like, what's the actual process of having found these? You know, where did you find them? How did you find them? What, what, where did these, where does this come from? Because it feels, you know, we hear often about uh, this tragic story of burned archives, of lost archives, but we have these stories. And I'm just curious about, about what's the, yeah. Uh, okay, let me be brief because uh, Mina uh, rightly said that it's a, like a final remarks and uh, what you asked about could be a presentation for a couple of hours, so I'll try not to do that. Uh, and very briefly, the documents, those documents were not actually lost, they were, they were found and saved after the Holocaust. These are just documents that were left behind in Vilnius. Uh, mostly in Vilnius, uh, later from, we received documents from other, other places as well. And uh, just taken at some point, they were taken into the Jewish Museum, uh, not at some point, but immediately after the war. Uh, but the museum, they were just gathered around the city and taken into the museum. But the museum was short-lived because the Soviet authorities closed it already in between uh, 48 and 49. And at that point, the National Library took uh, those documents under its uh, edges. But what happened then, the documents couldn't be processed there because of the same Soviet authorities. There was no framework for that work. They were just kept there and they, believe, you or, believe it or not, were forgotten. They were forgotten in the same National Library when they spent all those decades. And we, when we discover it, it's, you know, uh, discovering it was there all the time. Only several generations of librarians and, and archivists changed during the time. And the people uh, who, who we met, they just didn't know or didn't remember or knew very vaguely, vaguely that there is something there. And that something, happened in 2017, a year before we met uh, actually Ken. And, and then the discovery was all the more amazing when we understood that it was all the time there. Wow. wow. And there was, um, you know, and, and then you guys can dig, dig deeper into it because I try to bring some of the human angle in too. There was a non-Jewish uh, Lithuanian uh, librarian named Antanas Ulpas, who, yeah, exactly. um, uh, you know, with not without some risk, made sure that these things, you know, survived. Um, because, uh, you know, this starts getting outside of the scope of the story. But as a, you know, this is the thing where you are, and I would love to get back. I mean, you know, the history the archival history that is beneath your feet and everywhere in that part of the world uh, is yielding results, as Laura said. Yeah, I mean, I think there's more to be, I believe there is probably a lot more, I hope, I hope to be found. And and that is for a historian or somebody who wants to look into the past, these types of discoveries that open up new windows are just, that's the whole, that's the whole game, you know, that's the whole thing because- yeah. Vil, Vil, Vilnius or Vilna or Wilno, whatever you want to call it, uh, in that period between sort of 1920 and 1939 was like an incredible world city. I mean, it was an amazing and still it, it still is. But, you know. So find those archives. <laughs> Yeah, and I just wanted to to turn by that, that before we found the documents, we were just 
uh, uh, part of the library. We worked mostly with books. And overnight, we became one of the major Judaica archives in Lithuania. We became archivists without our, uh, like, without, like by miracle. And we now need uh, to, to, to just to be those archivists, although we haven't received the, the archival training or something, but we just, we feel responsible for that incredible legacy and also for the memory and can, uh, I don't know if you knew that this month, it will be a 120, 20th anniversary of the birth of Antanas Ultis. Exactly, and I'm writing now an article on, on him, and we will have a commemoration in the library as well. So he, you you mentioned his name just in time. Yeah, and I, and I will add one thing that made me like Antanas Olpus a lot. He was a tennis player, so good for tennis players. <laughs> That's right. He was also a, a football player. Oh, okay. And we have a photo, a great photo of him playing. Anyways, you guys are awesome. And this is, it's, Laura, it's so nice to see you. Give my best regards to everyone, please. I will, I will. Nicola especially, I, I'm happy to hear about her book. That's wonderful. Thank you, thank you. It, it's a pleasure for me even, uh, as well to have met you. Okay, well, thank you both very much. And thank you to everyone who's here virtually or not. Um, yeah. Okay. See you thank when you get back. Let us know if there's a tape of this. And, um, Zegas and we are waiting for you in Vilnius, Ken. I hope to be back. Yeah, please do. Bye. Bye.